Assalamu alaikum. Welcome back. You're watching Let's Talk with me, Anwar Mir, sitting in for um, the usual uh, host, uh, Mr. Ajmal uh, Mashroor. Ladies and gentlemen, today we're talking about China, the Uyghur community in particular, and discussing this with me are two distinguished guests, Abbas Faiz to my right, who is the South Asia analyst and lecturer at Essex University, and to my left, Duncan Bartlett, editor of Asian Affairs uh, International magazine. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just before we went off air, we were discussing about um, uh, uh, not only the issue, but also taking a comparative approach with other issues and, 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 and countries, in fact, and the way that they are dealing with this, um, uh, with this nation of, of China, a great nation, of course, uh, one of the most powerful nations in the world, and how it is possible to influence the way that they are treating the Muslim uh, community in their country. Now, I know a lot of you have been trying to get through, and my apologies, but we've been so engrossed in the debate, and I haven't been able to uh, or not wish to stop my guests from uh, their trail of thought because their contributions have been amazing and I, and I do wish to uh, go back to them. So if I can turn to uh, you please, um, Abbas. Um, in terms of the, uh, uh, the situation in um, uh, China, unfortunately we see that Muslim uh, contingents in a number of different countries are facing such fate that very few nations are either willing or able to intervene or influence the nations that are actually meeting out that sort of um, treatment, ill treatment uh, to those uh, contingents, to those people. Um, we, can, we can talk about a number of countries. Probably one of the most prominent ones is Palestine. Um, mm -hmm. You've got Yemen, <coughs> you've got uh, 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 Myanmar and, and what's happening to the Rohingya community there. I mean, there are also many, many other countries where you have uh, discrimination, I, I would say very nearing or if not above the uh, definition of ill-treatment uh, and possibly even persecution. Um, being an expert in South Asia, uh, what would you say about how it is possible, if at all, to limit Chinese influence, uh, if not in, in your area of expertise, South Asia? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> It, uh, I can give you an example of uh, what uh, happened in one of the countries of South Asia. It's a small nation, a very small nation. It's called the Maldives. Right. So uh, the entire population of this country is up to 400,000 people. Well, it's a very beautiful country, you know, good destination and so on. Now, <clears throat> the Chinese actually expanded into um, into the uh, islands of this country. So with the help of Saudi Arabia, they bought several of these islands and they started to develop these islands. So this coincided, and I mean coincided is probably a very kind of, you know, soft voice to say, uh, with the uh, development, with the, with the coming to power of a president in that country who was called President uh, Yamin. So President Yamin was elected on you know, a good electoral process, but he managed to somehow become the president because there was a coalition. As soon as he became the president, he started to, he went to China, came back, and after that, he started to, to imprison the leaders of all the other political parties. All the people who had actually coalized with him in order to bring him to power. They were either the entire opposition, the leaders, the leadership of the entire opposition. They were either in prison or exiled. And meanwhile, the uh, President Yamin, who was, he was getting closer and closer to China. And China was getting more and more entrenched in the Maldives. Now, at that time, the campaign that started was that really to bring some pressure from the international community on China to hold back a little bit and allow the uh, people to regain their hard-earned democracy, their <coughs> hard-earned human rights uh, issues. And this went on for a very long time. Yamin started to actually move out of all the international structures that were able to put pressure on him and force him to 
change the, you know, to improve the human rights situation. For example, President Yamin moved Maldives uh, out of the Commonwealth of the nation, of Commonwealth of Nations. So the Maldives, you know, well, withdrew itself from, from the Commonwealth. And as we know, the Commonwealth, the only pressure that the Commonwealth can actually put on a country is on human rights. There's just no other way on democracy and human rights. So those are the only areas where the Commonwealth was able to, um, to kind of you know, put pressure or criticize and so on. So he withdrew and from, you know, he actually started to cut ties with Western governments. But fortunately, um, international human rights organizations were able to start a very strong campaign and they got the support of the European Union, the countries of Europe, they got the support of China, the, sorry, support of Japan, Canada, the United States, and all of these diplomats of these countries really started to do a lot of work. They started to reach out to the people of the Maldives. And fortunately today, I'm in a position to really say that uh, the Maldives has become a success story for the human rights defenders again, because not only uh, they were able to uh, elect a new president, and of course the former president would not let go, but the pressure on China was really hard, and that led to China accepting that the people have decided to have a different type of president. And so they withdrew their support from, the, from President Yamin, and Fre President Yamin was toppled. So now we've got a, <clears throat> not only an elected president who is committed to human rights issues in the Maldives, but also an elected parliament, which was actually elected two uh, or three days ago, which is you know, a majority that really also supports human rights. So I think, I think there is a wave of change. There's a wave of change, and unfortunately, this wave will continue. And governments like, you know, um, governments in Bangladesh, in Myanmar, in other places will have to understand that, you know, they cannot just simply uh, kind of, you know, become a bedfellow with the government of China and then, you know, for, ju just protect themselves against the human rights criticism that will be coming out against them. Sure. So, I mean, um I must, uh, two issues arise from what you say. Mm -hmm. The first is that it's very easy to say to countries such as Bangladesh or, or other countries which, comparatively speaking, have economies which are totally on a different uh, s scale uh, to China or, or, or other sorts of nations of similar, um, uh, similar abilities. Um, so it's very difficult to actually say to them, look, you, you need to pull your socks up because they simply couldn't. The kinds of um, constraints that they have is just uh, uh, far too many, and um, they're insurmountable in my view. Uh, but also the second point uh, that arises from your, your analysis is that some people might say that it's very easy to point the finger at a country with a, uh, a Muslim majority uh, um, population, uh, uh, possibly a Muslim uh, head of state, and uh, criticize them because it's, you know, it, it, it's the end thing. It's very fashionable to do that. Um, if there is a, a Muslim majority country with a Muslim head of state, uh, if you want to criticize them, uh, the West will allow you to do it. Uh, other nations will not stop you from doing it. Um, in fact, the West may even fuel it. There are, oh, there are certainly certain quarters that will fuel it because any sort of instability, mm -hmm. any sort of hindrance, any sort of obstacles to Muslim majority nations, uh, you know, any, any sort of difficulties that can be placed in their way, um, is certainly not something that's against the interests of, some might say, the, the, the Western nations. Uh, but what are, so yeah, you want to I, interject? Yeah. If I may say, yeah. I mean, if we, if we want to talk about, you know, support for human rights from Western countries, we've got to, we, we can't go and knock at the doors of the foreign offices yeah. of these countries to get that support. We've got to go to Geneva, we've got to go to the, you know, to Look, let me, New York. Uh, let, <coughs> me, let me wind the clock mm. back mm. Uh, uh, some, some, some years. If you remember the Iran-Iraq conflict, 
the commentators were saying, or certainly some people in the right-wing uh, uh, um, uh, uh, perspective, they were saying it's a shame that both nations cannot lose. So there was a war between mm -hmm. Iran and Iraq, and people were saying it's a shame both of them can't lose. So it wasn't an ideological thing in terms of their uh, political leanings, whether they were Sunni or Shia, or whether they were yeah. communist or, or whatever they, you know, whatever um, one may attribute. Uh, of course, in in, in that particular conflict, uh, you had two sides who had various different reasons for going to war, territorial, religious, mm -hmm. sectarianism, whatever it was. But the West was saying, and certainly certain quarters of the West were saying, it's a shame that both parties cannot lose. And if one reflects on that, it seems to be the case that if any Muslim nation is, is having issues, uh, very few tears are shed. Um, and therefore, what I'm saying is that the Comparison with somewhere like the Maldives, um, where it's very easy to actually have a go at mm -hmm. the Muslim uh, uh, head of state and the, the government there, may be similar to what Iran is facing now. If somebody wants to point the finger at Iran and criticize them for whatever reason, it's, it's fair game. You know, it, 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 people, you know, what's the problem? They're criticizing Iran. Mm. As far as the, the West is concerned. So if you want to criticize Iran, for example, mm. for whatever reason, mm. whether it's justified or not, <coughs> you're welcome. I, I think, you know, the um, issue of religion yeah. is something that is really not, I mean, you know, sticking to an Islamic ideology, right. ideology right. was not the creation of a Western kind of entity. Right. It was something that developed from within the region. So, I mean, in Iran, we've got a, an Islamic ideology. In Saudi Arabia, the same. In all sorts of other countries, and there has it. It was the case that in the you know in the past decade, really, you know, governments who wanted to become more repressive, they felt that it was easier to go and become more Islamic. So. In the case of Iran and Iraq, unfortunately, both sides left, uh, lost, lost they did, actually. Yeah. Because when you talk about loss, yeah. I mean, it is the loss of the people, Absolutely. really. Not the loss of the governments, because the governments go for their own interests. Well, let me put that to uh, Duncan, th that mm. very point about religion. Um, what role, if any, uh, does religion play in the kind of um, the, the uh, uh, the narrative, nuanced or otherwise, uh, that we have in relation to this kind of volatility that we see around the world? Well, one of the things that China is particularly concerned about is what it sees as religious extremism. Now, for a religious person, there is always a debate about what's religious normality and what's extremism. What's a devout Muslim doing? Is they, are they an extremist if they pray three times a day? If they grow a beard? If women wear headscarves? Is that extremism if there's call to prayers from mosques? In the context of the Uyghur population of Xinjiang, the Han Chinese see that as being extremism. Because what they're worried about is that people are not putting their allegiance towards the central power in Beijing. And if you think about the communists, one of their key principles is there is no God. Religion, in Karl Marx's famous phrase, was the opiate of the people, wasn't it? Yes. And you remember that China had a big problem with opium addiction. <laughs> so the, the Uyghurs were being seen by the mainstream Chinese as holding back progress for many years. And they associated that lack of progress economically, the, the majority of the population, associated with the Uyghurs' religion and with their ethnicity. And that created resentment on the part of the Uyghurs, which is, of course, associated with their religion. And so when they did take angry reactions, terrorist actions, it was seen by the mainstream Chinese as being Islamic fundamentalist terrorism. And that's what the Chinese took these extreme measures by putting a lot of them into these camps, which they call education camps, vocational training camps, but which the Uyghur supporters say are much worse than that. They're detention centers and they're put into prisons without trial. They're not allowed to contact their families. So I think there's a very strong religious element here. The other thing is that in the past two or three years, the Chinese government has been centralizing control and it has been making a stronger narrative about the value of the Chinese Communist Party. So what it's saying is, the growth that we've enjoyed and the stability that we've got and the international respect that we've won has been won by us, the Chinese Communist Party, 
leading you, the people. And you all need to subscribe to that point of view, and that's why there's very little dissent about what the Chinese government do, does in the Chinese press, and indeed over these issues like the Uyghurs, you'll find that it's always presented in the best possible light. But the moment you step outside of China and you look at the international media from another, look at China from the perspective of the international media, you'll find that there's a lot of criticism. Um, uh Abbas, uh, mm. you, you've heard what, what uh, Duncan mm. says about that. Do you take a, a, a particular view on that in terms of the, uh, the role the religion is playing? I mean, taking, for example, um, I, I know your expertise is South Asia, but if we look at the situation in the Yemen, mm. uh, both sides, of course, uh, Muslim, mm. uh, uh, but the, the West appears to be, to the horror of its own citizens, supporting uh, Saudi Arabia, yes. even though the, the uh, Saudi Arabia is, appears to be, um, you know, inflicting a lot of uh, damage and uh, a, a lot of uh, casualties, in fact, uh, in the Yemen. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, um, the West seems to be happy or willing to supply um, mm. uh, ammunition and other sorts of weaponry in order for this ongoing, very dreadful, tragic situation. Mm. And it's continuing. There seems to be no, no, no end in sight there. there. There seems to be no end in sight. Yeah. Well, that is absolutely right. Yeah. And if you look at all the wars that are going on yeah. at the moment, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> they are the wars that in some way they have something to do with religion. Yeah. And in most parts, they seem to have something to do with Islam. Yeah. So, so technically, these are really the wars that are between you know, Muslim nations. So, I mean, if you go to Yemen, of course, you've got uh, you know, uh, an alliance of Western countries supporting Saudi Arabia and another alliance of, you know, Russia, uh, Iran, China, uh, Venezuela, if you like, who are supporting the other side. So there is really the, you know, the replacement of the Cold War is now which you know, which is what really I mean, I mean, you're very sure. I mean, you know. where are we going with this? I mean, as we speak now, the elections I, are taking place in yeah. Israel, um, uh, uh, and of course, um, the outcome of whichever of the two contenders wins uh, looks still to be bleak as far as the Palestinians are concerned. Mm. President Trump has just appropriated the Golan Heights uh, to Israel. Mm. I'm not sure that they, he had the locust stundi to do it. I'm not entirely sure that he can reconcile international law mm. um, uh, with that particular uh, declaration mm. or proclamation that he's made. But in any event, um, what we see that tends to happen and appears to be happening is that it is, of course, uh, religious Based. It is um, because they are Muslims uh, mm. and, and uh, Palestinians rather than Jewish Palestinians or Christian Palestinians. Yeah. Uh, it tends to be. There, there, it are tends two, to be. there are two sides to this. Yeah. Because one side is that you know, it will continue because, because you know, Western countries yeah. might, in some sense, be okay, feeling happy even that really you know, um, Islamic nations, Islamic ideology is being suppressed somehow. So that might be one side of it. But I have a prediction, and I'm going to actually make that prediction to Go you. Go ahead. I think the uh, Muslim nations of the world are coming to the realization yeah. that, you know, kind of sticking to Islam as a government ideology is not going to work. Right. So they are going to actually take charge of their their future. I think they've taken charge of their future in a number of countries and it will continue. I'm hoping that they've taken charge of their future. Do you future mean in, in terms of a, a nationalistic approach like Prince Salman <coughs> is doing, uh, rather than um, a, an approach uh, which is more uh, ideology based, r religiously inspired, for example? Is that, is that what you mean? Well, I mean, if you, you, know, if you think of uh, Pakistan, for example, right. after elections, yeah. I mean, it is, it is moving, you know, in another direction altogether. Yeah, yeah. It's more open, you know, yeah, yeah. trying to think of really, you know, take charge of the situation in the country, yeah. trying to... And, and he's doing very well. He's doing very well. So yeah. Pakistan is an example, and yeah. Pakistan is under the wing of China, but sure. nonetheless, yeah. people are just beginning He's moving to in the right direction. People are beginning yeah. to question, you know, yeah. what does it mean? What does, what is the concept of imperialism yeah. in 21st century? Yeah. Is it the same concept as we had in the 20th century, where, when you know the United States and Western countries were really the dominant powers, and they were 
exploiting, they were plundering the wealth of the third world countries. Now the same thing is happening, but China is coming you know, forward. So when Duterte in Philippines says that you know, our country is a province of China, what yeah. does it mean in terms of really the wealth of this country? Because you know, these are the you know, governments who are you know, extremely corrupt. And, and you know, they are very happy to come to some kind of... Tell us more about this prediction, because I think it's fascinating. So you're, 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 are you suggesting that the nationalistic approach is far more beneficial to the individual nations? I to think go the forth people have actually... Uh, I, I, think the, you know, I think the Islamic ideology has burnt out. Right. Because, you know, even in, 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 in Saudi Arabia, it's not going to work. Right. I think in Saudi Arabia, the dreadful... Uh, uh, kind of incident that took place in Ankara, in, in sure. Turkey with, you know, Khashoggi. The Khashoggi. I think that actually stopped some of the, you know, reforms that were going to take place. Right. But nonetheless, even in, in Saudi Arabia, it's not going to work. In Iran, it's not going to work. There is so the theocracy, uh, the theocracy approach is not going to work and it hasn't been working, it seems. Is that what, is that what you're saying? Theocracy yeah. has been working for quite some time. Right. In the past, you know, two or three decades. Sure. We've had theocratic governments. Yeah. In, in Pakistan, we had the first Islamic government in yeah. the world. Yeah. In Iran, we had an Islamic government in yeah. power. So in, 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 in Bangladesh, even, really, there is, you know, some kind of, you know, acceptance of, right. for example, Hifazat Islam. Uh, by elements within, you know, the kind of ruling, ruling, ruling sure. elite. Uh, so right. there is this, you know, impression that really, if you stick to Islam as an ideology, you are going to win. But that hasn't worked because it has created so many wars, and it has created so much really, pro so many problems. Look at, you know, the um, Myanmar situation, for example, the um, Rohingya. Yeah. I mean, who is supporting Rohingya? All these, you know, governments who are actually constantly talking about Islam, Islam, we want to spread Islam throughout the world. But, you know, when it comes to an Islamic kind of minority, who is actually supporting them? None of these governments are supporting them. They are only fighting each other over to, the and, and Some might say, though, I'm not trying to argue with you, but to be fair, um, a, a lot of countries, not just Bangladesh, which has sacrificed a huge amount of mm. territory, resources, goodwill, and so on and so forth, but also countries such as Turkey, which was one of the first to come forward. I mean, Turkey seems to be a special case in point. Uh, President Erdogan uh, seems to be there uh, speaking out, uh, 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 helping out, uh, mm. doing whatever he can, wherever he sees uh, Muslim contingents. Um, having issues and uh, having problems, he's there uh, on behalf of his people, and being rather remarkable. But I hear what you say. Um, but but even even in Turkey, I mean, yeah. President Erdogan is not yeah. as popular as sure. he was. I mean, recent sure. elections in Turkey, mm. recent you know kind of provincial, uh, local elections suggest the wind is going the uh, blowing in that the, really uh, the direction. People are beginning to think that look, you right. know, this. Ideology is not going to actually help. Is, um, is, is Abbas right? Do you agree with what he's saying that nations uh, need to take a more nationalistic approach, dispense with theocracy, dispense with the uh, where their, with their jurisprudence, which may be uh, divinely inspired and, and what have you? Uh, or uh, should it be the case that whilst they must pursue their nationalistic cause, the 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 the, the thread of their religious convictions um, will be an obvious attachment to causes such as the Rohingya or the Palestinians or the uh, uh, Uyghur. Well, you've put your finger, really, haven't you, on the debate which defines the global political dialogue. Is it multilateralism or is it patriotism, which is the most important value by which yeah countries are governed. Or, or is it both? Because uh, there is, uh, I mean, sorry to, 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 to cut you off, but Abbas does make a valid point in terms of, but do carry on. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I think he's talking about it in terms of Muslim uh, governed countries, but it's also a, a huge debate in the United States, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so a lot of people say that the America first policy yeah. of Donald Trump is based on an idea about patriotism. Um, and America is withdrawing from its global policeman role. It's, it's drawing back from its global responsibilities, America's critics say. 
America used to step in to uh, try to have influence on Asian affairs in Korea, for example, in Vietnam. Uh, it all ended in Afghanistan. It's not keen to intervene in, in, in um, the affairs of, 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 of Asia now. Um, China, of course, is presenting itself as being a multilateralist, not primarily a patriotic country. So, for example, Li Keqiang at the moment, the Chinese Premier, is visiting Brussels, and what he's been saying to the, all the European leaders is, we have much in common. We all agree, don't we, that the United Nations is the best way in which we can go forward in terms of global governance. We need to work together in multilateral arrangements on trade, like the Belt and Road Initiative. And of course, China's critics say, well, if you agree to that kind of multilateralism, what you actually do is give China the upper hand in the partnership. It's also a debate within the different European countries, isn't it? Is it better to be part of a bloc, the EU, in which there are shared goals both in terms of economy and politics, or is it better to have more individual autonomy and sovereignty? And that, of course, is the great debate which has been uh, festering here in the United Kingdom about the Brexit. Uh, it, it is, and I was just, whilst you were talking, I was thinking uh, about the Brexit position vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the, the position that we're discussing. Let me ask you this. Uh, take Bangladesh, for example, which is where my ancestor is from, um, and which our, our viewers, viewers tend to have a, an identity with. Um, if you were the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, uh, what would be your response, if any, to what's happening in China? How would you respond? So we can just take a, a, a snapshot view of uh, how that would shed light on what the responses of other nations could possibly be. Well, I'm pleased to say that I've been to Bangladesh a number of times and I've met a lot of politicians. <laughs> I have to say I don't aspire to be one. It looks like a pretty difficult job to be a politician in Bangladesh, yeah. from my observations as an outsider. Yeah. I actually admire anybody who goes into politics. I don't think it's an easy thing to do. But, I mean, what we were talking about earlier was the enormous gulf economically between a country like Bangladesh yeah. and a country like China. Yeah. It is you know, it's a mouse and an elephant, isn't yeah, it? Uh, and of course, China has seen this incredible economic growth. Yes, Bangladesh has had good economic growth for the past three or four years, but from a pretty low base. China, millions of people have been lifted out of poverty. Rural poverty in China is more or less disappearing. China, too, used to have a problem with famine like Bangladesh did in the early 1970s. That's disappeared. Everybody's got enough to eat. In fact, there's a growing problem with obesity now in China. And we've seen, of course, the rapid economic development with China creating the sort of problems that we've seen in Bangladesh, too. Overpopulation in the big cities, extra pollution, problems with the rivers, the effect on wildlife and so on. Um, so Bangladesh and China actually do have things in common in that they are big Asian countries which have been on a development path. As far as I can see, the, the way in which the Chinese are presenting things to Bangladesh is take a leaf out of our book look what we've done, work with us and we'll help you to be um, to rise through the ranks to become a middle income country within a few years just as we've done. And China's not going to ask Bangladesh's advice on any internal issue to do with China. It's not interested in what the it's Bangladeshis... Not so much. My question was, not, you, you say you don't aspire to be a politician, but you've actually <laughs> been one just now because you haven't asked the question. But it's not so much listening to Bangladesh or take, seeking advice, not necessarily seeking advice, but if you were the Premier of Bangladesh, uh, and as you rightly said, Bangladesh has been doing fantastically well. Um, but if you were the Prime Minister of Bangladesh, um, what would your response be? Not necessarily giving advice. What would your take be? Because there are many Bangladeshis, nations, I mean. There's many Bangladeshis. Uh, what I mean by that is not the individuals. I mean other nations which are in the same sort of boat, so to speak, All right. as Bangladesh. So there are many Bangladeshis. Yeah. Uh, what would their response be? Unless it's a collective response sure. through the United Nations or through any sort of... Um, uh, bodies which are regional bodies and what have you. What would a nation's response be or should it be or can it be 
well, we've seen it all over the world, including yeah. Africa, but mm. also a lot in Asia. Mm. Small countries, developing countries, have said, thank you very much, China, for the money. Definitely we want that investment. And China promises to build ports and airports and bridges new roads and, roads and bridges and, and, and parliamentary but that's buildings exactly and my point. friendship centres, conference centres, That's exactly centers, my point. Stadiums. What I'm trying to say is that countries like Bangladesh or similar countries, uh, they would not be able to be in a position to say anything whatsoever, forget influencing, uh, forget giving any sort of advice, uh, forget even suggesting any sort of observations that they ma might have as nations about what's going on in respect of the Rohingya community. What I'm saying is that these individual nations who are most likely doing exactly what Abbas is saying, which is following a patriotic path, uh, following uh, a path of Pakistan first, or following a path of Saudi Arabia first, um, they are doing those kinds of uh, systematic approaches for the benefit of their own citizens and their nations. So the last thing that they, well, they might think about the, uh, the Muslim community in, in China, but there's very little else they can do. What is the solution, which is, which is what I'm asking? Is the United Nations uh, an able body uh, which will have teeth rather than making uh, resolutions or even um, placing mm. resolutions? Uh, are there any teeth in those resolutions? Yes, there all? are. If the United Nations Security Council takes action against a country which it feels has breached international law... There'll be vetoes. Uh, if any, and who <laughs> sits, who's going to do that? Who sits as a China. permanent permanent member of the United Nations Security well, there you go. Council? Well, China absolutely. Does. absolutely. Mm. So that's what I'm saying. I mean, what is the solution to this problem? Do mm. we all um, sit back and say, well, it's happening, I see, what can I do? Do nations do that? Do individuals do that? Or is the answer going back squarely to the proposition that I placed at the outset, which is that uh, doing exactly what um, we see uh, has been done against Brunei, by, uh, triggered by just one celebrity, mm. uh, and then uh, you know, mm. the tailcoats of that celebrity have been held onto, so to speak, and you've had uh, it go viral. The, <laughs> the, the, um, the campaign against that mm. nation has gone viral. So is it up to individuals and citizens and uh, uh, other people who may have some weight on social media or whatever else it might be, rather than governments? Because mm. I think you've hit the nail on the head. A government like Bangladesh or, or any other government similar to Bangladesh wouldn't uh, be able to do anything. America could possibly be the only nation mm -hmm. who can speak up against China, but the last thing they are likely to do is speak up for Muslims in China, uh, 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 I if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But I think you may, well, you may well find political committees in Congress yeah. who are critical of China's human rights record, and I don't think they, they would separate it as being an issue that would be, oh, we won't criticise China over human rights because they're Muslims. I think you would find that. Certainly, I've been to meetings in the House but of Commons in the last few weeks here in London, at which there have been human rights campaigners who have been actively lobbying MPs to say, be careful what you do with the Chinese because this is their human rights record. Now, the thing is, though, that there's only so much influence any individual MP out of the 600 in the House of Commons can have on the government's policy. Yeah. And what I think will happen very soon is that the British Finance Minister, the Chancellor Philip Hammond, will go to China, yeah. and I think he will subscribe to China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is the big international investment project which China is leading. And I think he'll say well, that's in Britain's best it, economic it, it, interest. But of course there will be people within the government and critics who will say that's a mistake because mm. if you do that with China you will be effectively endorsing their domestic policies in terms of but Xinjiang and the But does not parliamentary Uyghurs. democracy and the way the political system in the United Kingdom works and the way the political institutions in the United Kingdom work uh, 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 remain in stark contrast to the way Congress works, where um, mm. people in Congress and teams in Congress may have their own ulterior motives or, or maybe overt motives as to why it is that they need to criticize or want to criticize China. Um, and they may bolt on what's happening to the Muslim contingent uh, onto their effective campaign against China and, 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 and what they want to do there. But it may be a different kettle of fish. I just want to, I think you wanted yeah, to come I think, in. I think it is very important to uh, to take notice of what I, you know, I would like to actually mention just now. Sure. Um, that uh, the closeness to China in South Asia, at least, where, you know, I know a little bit more about, you know, than other parts of the world, uh, has been, has not been an easy thing. 
because the governments have got closer to China. For example, the government in Sri Lanka, Rajapaksa, he got very, very close to China. And, and China actually lent a lot of money to, uh, the, to, to um, Sri Lanka. And Sri Lankan government is not a, uh, is not a Muslim government, sure. so it is a Buddhist government. Yeah. So, but there was an international kind of you know, uh, coalition of interest and pressure on, focused on Sri Lanka that actually brought about an election in the country and we've got a different type of government in power. And that government, the first thing that they did, they wanted to show that they are actually abiding by the wishes of the people by saying that we don't want China in our country. Abbas Faiz, only for time reasons, I am going to have to stop you there. Uh, Duncan Bartlett, it's been an absolute privilege. Ladies and gentlemen, these two special guests are very distinguished and they're very, very busy and we're absolutely uh, grateful to them for being able to share their thoughts and insights uh, with us and yourself. Our respected uh, Channel S viewers throughout the length and breadth, not only of the UK, but throughout the world, of course, we are online. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. Uh, next week, uh, or on the next occasion with Let's Talk, hopefully our regular um, host, uh, Mr. Ajmal Mashru, will be back. But this was me sitting in for Ajmal Mashru, Mr. Anwar Mir, and uh, do uh, keep us all in your prayers. Thank you very much indeed for watching once again. Assalamu alaikum.